Hello everyone, this is a not quite as fun video, uh, but I think an important one for the sake of review, so I'm just trying to get you ready for your uh, history test that you have this week. Um, if you haven't done it already, you should go onto Quizlet and use that to, um, to review for the fill in the blank portion of the test. Uh, what I wanted to review right now is just going over the back side of the test and covering some of that information. It's all stuff that you did last week with your packets and your worksheets, uh, but I just wanted to do a little lecture on it um, so that you're ready to go. Okay, so uh, Battle of Marathon. Just remember that you had the, um, the Greek battle line was heavy on the sides, heavy on the flanks, thin in the middle because... They were, it was a two to one, uh, they were outnumbered two to one by the Persians. And as a result of that, when the Persians attacked, right, uh, the center of the Greek line folded uh, or caved in um, and the Persians rushed into that, whereas the, the flanks stayed strong and beat the Persians back. So when the Persians kind of went into the center, they ended up being surrounded on both sides by the Persian, by the Greek flanks and the Greek flanks were then able to turn in and defeat the Persians in the center and drive all of them back towards their ships. Um, and we talked about how uh, essentially if, if you ever kind of uh, rush into a broken line of an enemy, you tend to lose your formation uh, and then you're also putting yourself in between the flanks of their army. So you're kind of outflanking yourself. Um, then the Greeks uh, chased them all the way to their ships where they set some of their ships on fire and then the ships took off. Um, after that, the uh, Persians uh, sailed all the way around the peninsula going to Athens and the soldiers who had just fought the battle had to make a quick march back to Athens. So that night they marched really fast back to Athens. By the time the Persians arrived there, the army was already back in Athens at the gates on the walls defending and it was so terrifying to the Persians that they turned tail and headed back to Persia. We talked about how that battle was so important because it was the first battle between East and West and the Western world won, right? The small, tiny, uh, freedom-loving Greeks beat the massive, uh, power-hungry empire of the Persians and uh, it was kind of a David and Goliath scenario. And if they hadn't won that battle, basically all of Western civilization would be lost, which is kind of true of the whole Greco-Persian War. Okay, um, Xerxes marching to Greece. So we talked about some famous stories that happen along his route as he's marching. Uh, first of all, we talked about how they would drink, the, the, Herodotus tells us that they would drink the rivers dry. There was so many men in his army, how they would take stones and throw them into a, the, one time they took stones, threw them into piles, and they ended up with these like mountainous piles of stones because there were so many guys. Um, we talked about how they stopped at one point to just look at this plain tree, this beautiful tree that Xerxes found really, really beautiful. And he stopped the whole entire army for a whole day, decorated the tree, and just made them kind of uh, appreciate the beauty of this tree. Uh, we talked about how they came to the Hellespont, and the first bridge that he built across the Hellespont got destroyed by a storm. And so Xerxes had his slaves go down and whip the water, literally whip it, and dip chains into it. Uh, to, and basically say to the Hellespont, how dare you defy uh, Xerxes, lord of the universe. Uh, so we saw this kind of arrogant pride like we've seen before with some of the Persian rulers where they just think that they're even greater than nature itself and are offended when nature goes against them. Um, and then he eventually was able to build a second pontoon bridge across the Hellespont and it took a week for his troops to cross. Um, we talked about Thermopylae. Um, you should have watched the Thermopylae video as well. We didn't talk about it, but I made you a video, a very cool video, I must say. I, I, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, kind of goofy, but fun. Uh, so Thermopylae, right, it was a narrow pass, bottleneck, and so the Greeks could use that with their small numbers to defend against the large numbers of the Persians because the large numbers were no use in a small space. Um, they built up that little wall uh, as kind of a defense location. During the first two days of battle, the Greeks basically just kicked the butts of the Persians every time, um, showing that the, the Persian soldiers really were not very good soldiers. There were a lot of them, but they weren't very, uh, they didn't work as a group. They weren't unified. They also didn't have very good armor, and they had pretty bad discipline and, and just courage in general. They weren't very courageous. 
Um, one of the things that the Spartans especially would do was to uh, pretend to be retreating, running away. And as they did that, the Persians, thinking they had them on the run, would break their ranks, their battle lines, race after them. And then all at once, the Spartans would lock into their shield wall and bam, the um, the the uh, Persians would just kind of hit up against that wall. So it was the classic fake retreat, which becomes a tactic that's used all throughout history for all kinds of battles. Um, we talked about then how a traitor led the Persians behind the Greeks along this mountain pass, came at them from the back. Uh, Leonidas sent home most of the soldiers except for his 300 Spartans and some other Greeks, um, and they uh, made a last stand on the third day of battle. Uh, and ultimately in that in that battle they were um, the the Persians had to whip their soldiers to go into battle because they were so terrified of the Spartans. Um, they were trampling each other because they were so terrified and trying to stay back and not have to be pushed into battle. And the Spartans were fighting uh, just as fiercely as possible. Uh, when their spears broke, they fought with their swords. When their swords broke, they fought with their uh, with their daggers. When their daggers broke, they fought with their teeth and and nails. Uh, so literally fighting like rats in a cage until they um, until they all perished. So that would be a really important thing on the test is to like focus on um, the bottleneck pass, the tactic of the re fake retreat used to kind of defeat the Persians, the mountain pass to get behind them and then also f talking about like how they fought so um courageously even to the very end like they didn't none of them surrendered um they just fought as hard as they could uh, even as their different pieces of, of equipment broke or were lost um, until they were finally defeated okay uh, i know i didn't make a video about salamis and platea so this is kind of your explanatory video for those battles um so at the battle of salamis uh, it's important to remember that before the battle, uh, all of the Greeks were in disagreement about what to do. Uh, most of the leaders of the Navy wanted to flee down to the Isthmus where the, where the main army of the Greeks had gathered. Um, and they wanted to use the Isthmus. Okay. Sorry. I had to pause the video for one second. Um, so most of the main armies had gathered at the Isthmus, and that's where the Navy wanted to go as well. They were looking at the number of Persians, uh, and they were getting pretty scared. Even though they had kind of won the Battle of Artemisium, they were pretty nervous about fighting them again at Salamis. So they all wanted to leave. Themistocles uh, basically uh, forced them to stay by sending a secret messenger to Xerxes saying, if you attack now they'll just scatter like they're all terrified they all want to flee um they're not going to fight you in an organized way if you just attack now you'll win so the Xer so xerxes stays up the whole night his he has his navy stay up the whole night patrolling the entrance to the bay um to stop any greeks who are trying to escape uh the irony is that like not, once the greeks find out they're trapped they all start working together right once it's not an option to leave they decide okay we're going to work together we're going to see this thing through um, and the next day when they come into battle formation, uh, Xerxes' navy is definitely not prepared. They think that they're going to face off against, um, against a pretty weak, uh, not, you know, kind of scattered, disorganized group. And instead they find this very tightly organized uh, group of ships that are in a narrow space. Again, a bottleneck. So their huge force of ships is not as effective. Um, and basically in the tightness of the space, the Persians are so crammed that they actually start sometimes uh, ramming each other and hurting each other. And as the um, and as the and there's another kind of retreat, a fake retreat, pulling them back and pulling the Persians deeper in. Um, and a couple other factors are there. We see that the Persians uh, again don't have very good sailors. Their sailors are mostly land people who have been made sailors. So when they fall into the water, when their ship goes down, pretty much all of them are drowning. Uh, the ones who do actually swim to shore, um, Aris uh, Aristides is there on the shore, going up and down the shore, killing all of those who actually make it to the shore alive. Um, so really none of them are, are surviving. Um, and Xerxes thought that the reason they had lost at the Battle of Artemisium was because he wasn't physically present himself. He was present at Thermopylae, and he just basically believed, like, the fear of me is the primary motivating factor for my men. So at the Battle of Salamis, he had a throne set up on a hill. He was watching. He had like a little board where he was tick marking who was doing well, who was doing poorly. And he was going to like, and he told his captains, I'm going to reward you or punish you based on how you fight in this battle. 
Um, ironically, during the battle, he actually, uh, and so, well, for one, it just shows like his whole mindset, right? He, he just thinks that the only thing that can motivate men is fear and, and rewards uh, and punishment. So punishments, you fear punishment or you want a reward. Whereas the Greeks are fighting for the love of homeland, for their honor, right? There's a lot, there's deeper motivations for the Greeks. Um, ironically, Artemisia, the one uh, female captain of one of Xerxes' ships, uh, she, in trying to escape from an Athenian ship, uh, rams one of the Persian ships to trick the Athenian ship and make it think that she's on their side, so they leave her alone. And Xerxes, watching from up on the hill, says, says oh, good on you, Artemisia, great work. <laughs> uh, gives her a, a big check mark on the board. You know, she did a great job, even though she had destroyed one of their own ships and turned traitor. So it really just shows kind of the, when you, when you motivate people only through fear, that's what you get. You get people who are willing to do whatever it takes to kind of get ahead, even if it means hurting your own side. So it, is it, you know, the question is, is, is it ultimately really that effective? Okay, then um, next, the Battle of Plataea. After the Battle of Salamis is lost, Xerxes is done. Um, he's just, he can't believe that he that uh, this happened to him. Uh, he flees with his army back to the bridge of the Hellespont, and as they're going, people are dying from plague, starvation. Uh, they're coming back now with a much smaller army. Lots of them have died, and so people are a lot less willing to give them food and supplies. So um, then Plataea happens. Uh, the, the, the army under Mardonius winters, the Persian army winters, tries to make a peace treaty with Athens, Athens flat out denies them, and they ultimately meet at Plataea. Now Plataea is down by the Isthmus, so that's where the Greek armies had gathered. Um, in this battle beforehand, both sides got this oracle that they were not supposed to um, fight, they were not supposed to engage first, whoever engaged first would lose. Well, Mardonius ultimately decides to ignore that um, and decides to just go into battle uh, regardless. And the night before, I, so this is kind of an interesting story, the Greeks had decided to move positions. Um, and so the, but this one Spartan guy, you don't have to like tell the story on the test, but it's kind of funny. Um, the one Spartan guy says like, I'm not retreating. I will, I'm going to stay here by myself. So all the Spartans stay, you know, because they're not going to abandon their guy. The Athenians see the Spartans staying, so they stay. Um, so they're kind of like right where they had been camped, whereas the rest of the army is pulled back. Well, the next morning, the, finally the Spartan guy decides to retreat with everybody else. So he starts retreating and, um... The next morning, the Persians look, they see the whole army gone and just the Persian, the Spartans and the Athenians out in front, and they're all retreating, and they think we have them on the run. So they charge into battle totally without order or structure, um, which again, just proves to be a huge detriment to them. They, they get all spread out, all strung out, and once the Athenians and Spartans turn around, and once the other Greeks come and join them, uh, they just rip the Persians to shreds. And the Persian army really falls apart once Mardonius goes down. Mardonius is killed, and um, we see here that the, the, the Persians are kind of useless without a leader, right? Unless they have a leader who's driving them, again, by either fear or reward, they have a slave mentality. They think like slaves, and so they just flee. They, they have no vested interest in honor or in fighting for their country or anything like that. Um, whereas the Greeks, their leader could go down, and they're going to, like we saw at Thermopylae, right? Uh, Leonidas went down and they continued to fight tooth and nail until the very la until none of them were left. So it really is a big contrast between them, which um, and then ultimately those they, they flee back to this fortress they had built um, the Persians at the Battle of Plataea and they're all slaughtered in this big fortress. They just kind of cower uh, before the Persians and are are cut down. So this brings us finally to the difference between Persian and Greek soldiers. A um, couple things. For one, worse equipment. Uh, they have wicker shields, wicker um, armor, pretty light um, weaponry, whereas the, the Greeks pretty much are all heavy uh, infantry. They're wearing pretty heavy armor. Their, um, their shields, their weapons are just are more heavy duty, so they've got better equipment. Um, they've also, uh, they're just better soldiers. So you've got quality versus quantity. You've got uh, a lot of Persians, but very poor soldiers. And you've got a few Greeks, a lot fewer Greeks, but very highly trained soldiers. Um, and last of all, uh, you have a real big difference in motivation. Uh, the Greeks are, love their freedom. They're fighting for their freedom. The Persians are fighting because they're uh, fearful and or they want or they're greedy. Um, both of which are not nearly as motivating of rewards at, of, of motivations as um, as just loving freedom and loving your homeland. Okay, that's it. Good luck. If you have more questions, contact me and I will answer them.
I love you all, and I hope that you do well on this test. Please do well. Okay, see you later. Bye.